I've been interested in the outdoors for as long as I can remember, even as a young kid. Uh, and then, you know, as I got old enough to go hunting, I started with small game and worked my way up to deer. Uh, shot my first deer back in 1979 at the age of 16. And when I shot that buck, it's like my whole world changed. I forgot about all my other outdoor interests and just focused on whitetails and specifically for big mature bucks. Yeah, I'm Dennis Higgins. I'm Don's dad. And they want to talk about my son as he's grown up. He has always enjoyed the outdoors and animals. Because I remember coming home from work, I didn't know what kind of animals it would be in the backyard. But he, he started young, started trapping. He liked to trap animals. And then, but then he got, then he got old enough to, to carry a gun. I, I took him rabbit hunting, and he enjoyed rabbit hunting with me. And then, come deer season, he said, "Dad, I'd like to hunt deer." And I said, "Well, that's okay. We'll we'll try it." So but we found place here not too far from us and he built a stand and I built one. Come opening day of that first year, that's his deer season, well I sat near the tree and it had just turned day, daylight and I heard him shoot three times and I thought, well, I wonder if he's got one. When here he comes walking up it real slow and easy and says, like this, Dad, I just shot a big buck and not excited or nothing. I about fell out of the tree when he did it. We, so we managed to get over to get to him and we drug him out. We hauled that poor deer all over the country showing people. You know, when I shot that first buck, I was, I was, would have been happy to shoot any deer, really. It didn't have to be a buck, uh, but I was blessed that it was a nine point buck. But, you know, I, I, I've really always been a trophy hunter this, to some degree. I just kept raising the bar slowly. Um, I, I remember it. As a young hunter, I dreamed that one day I could shoot two bucks that would score 125 inches and make Pope and Young. And, uh, you know, I eventually did that. And, you know, somewhere along the way, back in my early 20s, I, I even gave up gun hunting just for the bow only. Uh, it was that, probably the main reason I did that was because archery season was three and a half months long, whereas uh, gun season was six days in my home state, Illinois. I just wanted to spend as much time in the woods uh, chasing deer as I could. So, you know, in my early 20s, I just totally gave up gun hunting, and I've been a bow hunter ever since. You know, as I was maturing as a deer hunter, and I was continually raising the bar to shoot bigger and bigger bucks, there was one ultimate goal that I had all along, and that was to shoot a world-class buck. And by world-class, I mean a buck, uh, a typical scoring at least 190 inches, or a non-typical over 200. And, uh, you know, I, I just kept, I, I'd never really seen a buck like that in the wild, but I always had that dream. And then during the 2004 season, um, I was sitting in my stand on November 6th, I'll never forget it. And there was a buck that had been chasing does through the brush. I could hear him grunting as he was chasing them does, but I couldn't get a good look at him. And then the does started filing out past my stand and here comes the buck behind him. And I was just absolutely shocked when the buck that came out was a giant. He had more points than I could even count. And uh, I thought, sure, I was gonna get a shot at him because those does were working their way right past my stand. And he just stood at the edge of the brush watching them. And the does eventually turned around and went fed back the way they had come. And when the last doe was in the brush, the buck just turned around and followed them right back in. But, you know, on that day, I made up my goal that I was gonna kill that buck. And to that point in my hunting career, I was just setting a goal as a certain class of bucks. For instance, I wanted to shoot a buck at least 150 inches. But on that day, I started setting my goal to kill individual bucks, and I wanted to kill that one. And so then the uh, the race was on. I had to had to kill that buck. And, and every hunt that I went on for the rest of that season, I was after that buck. Every morning, every evening, I was in that area hunting that deer. Um, I eventually killed the buck on December 1st, uh, almost a little shy of a month after I'd first seen him. But I really wanted to do things a certain way. I didn't want to shoot a, a world-class buck that was running by with his tongue hanging out, uh, being chased by uh, you know guys on the drive or anything like that. I just wanted to shoot a world-class buck going about his business, doing what big bucks do when they think nobody's watching. And that was exactly what happened on December 1st of 2004. You know, I was sitting in my stand, these other deer passed, and then out steps the giant. And, I just, uh, he stopped behind a big tree 
and I had to turn around in my stand to shoot. Uh, but him stopping behind that tree gave me a chance to do that. And that, that big tree blocked his vitals and uh, you know most of his body. He only had to take one or two steps out and he was gonna be in perfect range for me to shoot. And that's exactly what happened. I sent an arrow right through him and away he went. Uh, you know, I slipped out, got some friends to come back later and, and help me retrieve him. I mean, I knew how big he was. I knew it was the biggest buck I'd ever seen alive. He had more points than I even knew, but um, ended up uh, retrieving him with friends later that evening. Uh, he had 20 points, ended up scoring 214 inches. I'd like to say that, uh, you know, everybody was happy for my success, but that actually wasn't the case. There was uh, a couple local hunters that uh, had seen that buck uh, earlier in the season. They were after it as well. And when they found out that uh, I had shot it, they'd made some untrue accusations against me. Even called in uh, the game wardens, uh, the Illinois Department of Conservation, uh, conservation officers uh, showed up. And to make a long story short, they confiscated that buck from me. You know, I, I'd lived my whole life waiting for that moment. I'd done everything right. I'd uh, passed up uh, unethical shots at that deer when I could have taken them. Um, I waited for the right shot and made a good, clean, ethical kill on the deer. Um, had permission to be where I was hunting. Everything was 100% legal, but I was accused of wrongdoing. Uh, I had to hire an attorney and go to court. Uh, 34 days later, I got my buck back. The first day we walked into the courtroom, uh, I got the, the buck back. But, you know, the whole incident kind of left a sour taste in my mouth because, you know, there was people that didn't really know me and they had heard that I'd been, you know, had my buck confiscated and been accused of doing things wrong. And I made up my vow on that day that I'm gonna kill another 200 inch buck. And next time I'm gonna do it on video and put all doubters to rest. I had no idea that it would take me 13 years to get that done. But uh, during the 2017 season, I finally got it done. 13 years later, I shot another 200 incher and got this one on video. That 13 year journey to kill my second 200 inch buck was, uh, was a journey that really taught me a lot as a deer hunter. Um, you know, up until that point, um, I was just hunting for bucks of a certain uh, size. You know, a 150 inch buck was my goal. Any buck that came along that was 150 inches, it didn't matter if he was a three year old or a 10 year old, he was getting shot. And I really started paying attention to the age structure of the bucks because if a 150 inch buck came along that was only a three year old, that was a buck that I knew had a chance to be really special if he could make it to five or six years old. So I started passing those bucks, um, bucks that I would have gladly shot in the past. I also started hunting individual bucks. That first 214 inch buck that I shot was the first time that I ever set my sights on a single buck and hunted a single animal. But every season since then, that's exactly what I've done. I've just uh, looked for the biggest bucks I could find and considered their age and decided if, if I'm going to let that buck grow to another to an older age class and hopefully bigger rack or if I was going to harvest him and that's what I've done during that 13 years and there were some real memorable bucks that come along during that time period. Uh, one thing I learned was how rare a 200 inch buck is. Uh, there was two bucks during that 13 years that came really close to the 200 inch mark. Uh, one of those was killed on the, on the very property where I had killed my 214 and it was killed the very following season by a good friend of mine who owned the property. And in the next year after I shot my 214, he shot a 196 out of one of my stands. And then a few years after that, uh, you know, I got permission to hunt a new property and I was getting trail camera pictures of a really nice buck that I thought would push 200 inches. And it just so happened that before the rut even got heated up that first year uh, that I was hunting this buck, a neighbor shot him uh, that buck was taken to the Illinois Deer Classic that year and officially scored at 199 inches. Uh, so he was within an inch of, of being 200, but just not quite there. So, uh, you know, there was a lot of those bucks uh, that never had the, the uh, genetics to reach 200 inches. Um, some, some were real memorable bucks that lived on my farm. There's a couple in particular. There's one that uh, at four years old, he had 13 points and uh, his rack would have pushed 170 inches. 
and I let him walk 13 times that year and got actually got every one of those 13 passes on video. Uh, next year as a five-year-old, he was just a little bit bigger. He was probably uh, you know, around 174, 175. I, I again passed him several times and, and on video. The next year he was a six-year-old, he's still in the mid-170s. and I figured at that point he's probably never going to reach uh, 200 inches, so I went ahead and shot him as a six-year-old. So there was a lot of memorable bucks that came along in that 13 years, but still none of them quite made that magical 200-inch mark. And one of the things that really struck me during that 13 year period was how different the personalities are from the different bucks. Um, going into the 2017 season, I had two bucks that I thought would push 200 inches that season. One was a buck I called Smokey, another was a buck I called Trump. And they were totally opposite kinds of bucks. Smokey had grown up on my home farm. I'd been watching him since he was two and a half years old. I got to know him so well. He had a small core range that he, he seldom left. He was visible in the daylight. And, uh, you know, he's a buck that I passed uh, every season. When he was five years old, the buck was over 180 inches. And I felt so confident that that buck was not going to get killed by anybody because his home range was so small and it was on my property that uh, I was able to let him go multiple times. I think I passed him five times as a five and a half year old uh, scoring in the mid 180s. One of his traits was that he really liked to bed in a tall switchgrass field that I had on my property and um, that, that's actually where he ended up coming out the evening I shot him, uh, but he really liked those tall grasses and that was just one of his personality traits. You know, I had actually, by the time uh, t the summer of 2017 rolled around and I actually started getting trail cameras and pictures of Smokey and, and seeing that he really was a 200 inch buck this year. I knew that buck so well by that point that I was going on podcast and, and giving myself a 95% chance of killing that buck. I was just that confident. In fact, I was so confident that uh, I put up a new 360 hunting blind that summer and I told the guy that was helping me put it up, I said, I'm going to kill a 200 inch buck out of this blind. I, I knew where I was going to kill him even. And it, uh, you know, it took 13 years to get to that point. Um, but when it all came together, it just seemed so simple. I, I, knew, uh, I knew I was going to do it, and I knew where it was going to happen at. And uh, it's totally different uh, than any other buck I've ever hunted. I just really got to know Smokey that well. When the 2017 hunting season finally opened, I, I was ready like I've never been in my life. I mean, I finally had that 200 inch buck to hunt. I knew he was 200 inches, and I knew if he was still alive when season opened, I was gonna get a crack at him. The bad thing is, is I needed a northwest wind to hunt the blind where I thought I would shoot him. And for the first 10 days of season, the wind was out of the south or southwest. And finally, on October 11th, we got that first northwest wind.
I went to the blind with uh, cameraman Kyle Harmon, and sure enough, Smokey shows up, but he's too far away for us to shoot. He comes out of those tall bedding grasses that he likes so well. So we, we did not get a crack at him uh, on that hunt, but we did get some great footage. Three or four days later on October 15th when we finally got another northwest wind and again I felt pretty confident uh, you know the, the conditions were perfect um, we sat there for a couple hours and we're seeing a little bit of deer action not a whole lot um, but the Sun started to set and I was thinking well it's not gonna happen this evening but I looked out into that uh, switchgrass field and I could see the grass move and there was a deer coming towards us and towards the food plot right in front of the blind uh, but I couldn't even tell if it was a buck or a doe because those grasses were so tall. I grabbed my binoculars and, and looked and I could see antler tips. So I knew it was a buck at that point, but I still didn't know which buck. And then when the buck steps out of the tall grass, I, I knew instantly it was smoky. And I, I reached for my bow as, as Kyle's running the camera. And the only thing I could think of was 13, 13. I just kept repeating 13. I'd waited 13 years for this very moment, for this very shot, and it was about to happen. <laughs> Unbelievable. Man, I thought it was over for the evening. I thought it was over and I looked up and I seen the prairie grass just moving a little bit. And I focused in on that spot and I could see that giant rack just moving that prairie grass. I told Kyle, here he comes, here he comes, here, here comes a buck, you know. I grabbed up my nose and I could see it was him. Tell you what, I've waited 13 years for this. 13 years. 13 years ago, I shot a 214 inch buck. And I've been trying to get another 200 incher ever since. And, and I mean, I've, I've searched, I can't even tell you how much I've searched for a 200 inch buck. You know, after the shot, Smokey ran straight away from us down that clover fire break. And he turned around and looked right back at me one last time and it was like the end of a long relationship. I chased that buck and got to know him for several years. Uh, I'd passed him years past and uh, just before he tipped over he turned around and looked right back at me and it was kind of a bittersweet moment actually. Uh, uh, the, the challenge of chasing him was now over and uh, you know it, it kind of got to me a little bit.
First person I'm gonna call is my dad. My dad is, he took me hunting whenever I was a kid. He wasn't even a hunter himself, but because I wanted to go hunting, he always took time off from his job to, to take me hunting and everything. And I want him to be here whenever we drag this buck out and walk up on him for the first time. So I'm gonna call my dad right now and see if I can get him out here. Hello? Yeah, you still down there at the Wiener Roaster? What time are you heading home? Oh, we can head home about any time, Well, I just shot a giant buck. I wanted you to go with me and get him. Oh, okay. Yeah, that'll be fine. Yeah, okay. He, he's down. We don't have to go look for him. We've seen him fall, and i got a camera guy here that's uh, videoing it all. So. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. All right. We'll see you in a little while. Okay. All right. Bye. The day he shot him, we was at a winter roast down, oh, probably 35, 40 miles from here. And, and we just kind of finishing up the winter roast and messing, talking with our friends of ours. And I got a call from Don, and Don says, Dad, I got a big buck. I need help getting him out of the woods. And I thought, well, that's awful weird. Because he's never had he never had me help. But I thought, I said, okay, I'll be there. And he said, no need to hurry, but I'll... I said, I'll be there just quick let me get there. So so when I arrived up there, he says, well, he says, I got smoking and I just wanted you to be in the film as we retrieve him. I said, well, that's great. Let's go get him. You know, when I shot my first buck back in 1979, my dad was there with me to help me drag that buck out. And he had not been with me to drag another buck out in all those years. And I decided that summer before I even shot Smokey that if I got that buck, the first person I was calling was my dad. You know, that, that's exactly what I did. I knew Smokey was down, not 100 yards away, but uh, I wasn't going to go out and look at him until my dad was there. And, you know, I called him and he showed up uh, an hour or so later and we went and recovered Smokey. And it, it was really special to have him along. You know, I was, I've been blessed to have great parents. And uh, my dad didn't push me, or my mom, either one. They didn't push me into doing something that they wanted me to do. They let me find my own way in life, and then uh, whatever interest I had, they helped me however they could. And I still remember my dad taking the vacation time from his job just to take me deer hunting. And uh, you know, without that, I'd have never been able to accomplish all I have in the deer hunting world. And I'll tell you what, I, I don't think you can have a boy any prouder than that. When he had that big deer, uh, he was grinning for me. Ear to ear, and he's really, and I was proud of him too. I mean, he's he's a part of my He's a very dedicated hunter, and, and enjoy, enjoys it, and tries to be as sincere as it can be with it. What do you think about that? Well, there he is. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> John said, there he is. <laughs> you know what you got to say? I'm kind of speechless. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. That doesn't happen often. Yeah, you got to roll. He made it to the thick of stuff, did he? <laughs> Yeah, he just barely made it back into the cover. Well, this is a buck at uh, six and a half years old. I've watched him grow up since he was two and a half. Um, let him go last year. He was he scored in the 180s a year ago. Found that both his sheds last spring. Actually, got his sheds for the last two years. But. Uh, Don't really know what to say. <laughs> That's what it is. That's what it is. Twenty three and a half. Twenty four right on there. <laughs> Twenty four right on the nose. <laughs>
now that I had Smokey killed and my first Illinois buck tag on him, I still had another buck tag and another buck to go after. I'd been watching a buck I called Trump for several years. In fact, he was seven and a half years old last fall uh, when I went after him. Um, he was a buck that was totally opposite of Smokey. He had a big range. Um, I, I had two pictures of him three miles apart that were only taken 17 hours apart. Uh, he moved mainly at night. Uh, there was absolutely no pattern to what he did. He just uh, moved about a, a big range at night and I, I knew he was going to be a tough buck to kill. In fact, right after I'd shot Smokey, my goal for the rest of the season was just to lay eyes on Trump in daylight hours. And that was it. It wasn't to kill him, it was just at some point in the rest of that season I wanted to lay eyes on him in the daylight. Well, so I go out to, on my next hunt, I'm back in, in Trump's area. It was my 10th hunt for Trump. And the first nine hunts, I had not seen a single deer, not even a doe. I was just out in, in places that uh, you wouldn't expect to see many deer, but that's the kind of places that Trump liked to go. And I knew if I just kept plugging away sooner or later, I may lay eyes on him. So I head out on that 10th hunt. It's a real calm day, and I'm, I'm in a fence row overlooking a standing cornfield. And you could have heard a, you know, a mouse running through that corn at 100 yards. That's how quiet and still it was. But uh, I'm sitting there and I hear a single corn stalk rustle out in that corn. And I knew it was a deer. And I only heard that one rustle and then it was silent again. And so I knew there's a, there's a deer moving. I stood up in my stand. I didn't grab my bow or anything. I just wanted to be standing. The next thing I know, Trump steps out of the corn 30 yards from me and it instantly starts walking right at me. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I wanted to lay eyes on him in daylight, here it is. And it's the very first hunt after I just killed Smokey. So I instantly reach down for the video camera and as I'm doing that, I'm also, I also glance up to see Trump coming at a fast clip and I knew there wasn't any time to mess with that camera. It's either mess with the camera or grab the bow. And I decided to grab the bow as quick as I could, uh, snapped on the release and come to full draw. And there he is at 15 yards. Put an arrow through him. And off he goes. Now, I wasn't sure about my shot to, on Trump. It, it didn't look that good to me. You know, I, I decided I was just going to back out and come back the next morning. Uh, I came back with my good friend and business partner, Kevin Boyer, and also called in a uh, deer tracking dog, Ron Slifer, and his dog, Dio. Uh, had them along as well because I just, uh, there was you know, 100 acres of standing corn right there, and I knew that it was going to be difficult to find that, that buck in that corn. Um, but Dio got on the track, and uh, it wasn't long before we jumped Trump. He was still alive, actually. Uh, and the chase was on. Uh, we jumped him uh, two more times and decided to, to back off for a full 24 hours. Kevin and I decided that before we brought the, the bloodhound in, we would uh, start on the track ourselves uh, because. Trump didn't look in good shape when we'd last seen him. We didn't think he was going to go all that much farther. He'd lost a lot of blood. Um, you know, by this point, we had tracked him probably three quarters of a mile, and he had bled the entire way. Uh, so we come back the next morning. The plan was for Kevin to take up the blood trail, and I was going to wait on the other end in case uh, he was still alive and Kevin pushed him out. So Kevin drops me out on the far side of uh, the timber, and, and he drives around and starts on the blood trail. I just found myself a place to hide in some brush and sit on a log where, where I could get a good view of the entire timber in case uh, Kevin jumped to Trump. And I, I just barely sit down and my phone rings and it's Kevin calling me. He hadn't gone 20 yards from where we left off the day before and there lay Trump dead in the creek bank. Uh, he had the video camera rolling as I walked up to Trump for the first time. Not 20 yards from him by not pushing him though. Unbelievable. A couple sleepless nights. Yeah.
I already thank God on the way here. I better do it again. I don't even know what to say. I started watching this buck when he was two and a half years old. I got trail camera pictures back to when he was two and a half. And uh, I'd get his picture every summer. There was a, there's a spot to, that I hunt where there's a bachelor group every year. And he was part of that bachelor group from the time he was two and a half in that spot. And then uh, last year he was six and a half, between five and a half and six and a half. He really put on a bunch more uh, extra growth, extra sticker points and such, and uh, so I started going after him. I didn't think I really had a chance because he would move from his summer range in the fall, and, and he would spend the, the fall and winter elsewhere, and I had no idea where it was because I, you know, once he moved, I, I quit getting his pictures on any of the properties I hunted, so, you know, last season, I, I spent the, most of the season, I, I was hunting for Trump, don't get me wrong. I was hunting for him, but mainly what I was doing was moving trail cameras like crazy, just trying to get a bead on, on his range, you know, where he lived. And uh, kind of put some of the pieces of the puzzle together. So, so this year, uh, what was it, five days ago, I shot uh, a buck I call Smokey. And uh, you know, I took a two or three days there to, uh, to take care of, of Smokey and you know, get pictures taken, get him to the taxidermist, things like that. So I wasn't hunting for, for about three days. And then the first hunt, well actually the evening I was taking Smokey to the taxidermist, uh, my cell phone went off. I've got some Spartan cameras out in Trump's range and that, that camera went off or my cell phone went off saying I got a picture. So I'm on my way, it's like uh, 6.30 in the evening, still daylight, and my camera goes off and, and I got a picture of Trump in daylight during hunting season. And, and it was right during prime hours and I, I, just, I couldn't believe it. And I was like, oh, Rio, you know, here's a, here he is, he's moving in daylight. The next day, I didn't hunt because my grandsons were here, Wyatt and Walker, they were here from Indiana and I wanted to spend time with them, so I didn't hunt, but the, the very next day, I went out, I didn't hunt close to, right on top of where we got the picture a couple days before, but I had a stand, to, you know, a couple hundred yards away where the wind was perfect for. Finally, you know, just out of the blue, it comes together and it was the, the very next hunt after I shot Smokey. And I, I don't have any idea what Trump's gonna, or yeah, what Trump's gonna score here, but Smokey scored 206 very next hunt I get in a stand and shoot this deer so man other than tell the story I don't even know what to say I'm blessed beyond belief uh, my wildest deer hunting dreams did not even did not even match this and, you know, I tell young people all the time you know find your chase your dream but dream big you know God's reality is so much bigger than anything we can possibly dream and, and I'm experiencing it right here uh, I, I could have never dreamed that I would do what I've done this season, and, and I give all the glory to God. Uh, you know, He made the awesome critters for us to, to pursue, and uh, they just kind of consume me. It's, I, I don't have any other hobbies or passion. It's my family and, and whitetails. And I just I don't I don't even know what else to say. You know, for 13 years I had the goal of shooting a 200 inch buck and never in my wildest dreams did I think that I would shoot two bucks on back to back hunts that would total 400 inches. It's just, I can't even describe it. You know one of the really interesting things I learned during this 13 year quest was that some years there's not going to be a buck that I want to shoot. Um, there just isn't. Uh, I've raised the bar to such a level that I never even dreamed was possible a few years back. But on those years, you know, I still enjoyed deer hunting. I still enjoyed going out and getting video footage of bucks, uh, learning the patterns of the bucks that uh, are maybe a year or two away from being shooters. So, uh, 
you know, I've got to the point where I don't have to kill a deer uh, to be having fun deer hunting. It's the challenge of the chase, and that just become uh, you know more pronounced over the 13 years. Uh, killing bucks is a lot less important to me now than it was 13 years ago. Now, don't get me wrong, I still want to shoot giants, and if I could shoot a giant every year, that'd be great. But that's just not reality. So, you know, after shooting two bucks that uh, total 400 inches of antler on back-to-back -back hunts, uh, a lot of people ask me, well, where do you go from here? You know, I'll just keep plugging away. I'll keep uh, spending time in the deer woods, uh, learning new bucks, and, you know, hopefully another 200-incher comes along one day.